You've lost the respect of the community that you claim to serve. That means you can't serve them anymore. Hello, and welcome to If Grapes Could Talk, your one and only source into the corrupt lives of wine country's elite. And who am I? Who were Dominic Vipoli's biggest supporters? Well, those and many others are secrets I am happily telling. If you have not seen my most recent episode, The Great Women Behind the Great Monster, I sincerely suggest you do so. While I'll do my best to make this episode make sense, even if you haven't, it's a really good episode. I think you'll enjoy watching it. And there really is just too much background information for me to turn into a quick, concise previously on. And as always, If Grapes Could Talk is about real people and real corruption, and today we will be touching on the theme of sexual violence as I continue to discuss the enablers of Dominic Fapoli, who is an alleged serial predator. So in the last episode, I discussed my and other concerned citizens' efforts to bring the allegations against Dominic Fapoli to the attention of prominent women leaders in the community. The main four that I'll be continuing to discuss today are Windsor Wonder Woman Karen Alves, Councilwoman Deborah Fudge, former Councilwoman Maureen Merrill, and former Chamber of Commerce CEO Lorraine Romero. Recording right here, yes, I chopped off my hair. Lori and the Downtown Windsor Merchants Association is not relevant to this episode anymore. And I do wanna further em emphasize that it is Karen, Deborah, and Maureen who really would have had the power to do anything here. And I think the quickest way for me to get you to get like that power deferential is to remind you that like we're small business owners in a small town that really hasn't brought in the tourism dollars. We are not raking in Tesla money. Those are three of our best customers. Those are scary women to piss off. And then I said I would explain how Kathy Green Cully fits into the ladies who lunch. And what I've now decided to do is actually do a very special episode on her. I've received quite a few tips about bigotry and racism with her, which I completely believe. I had my own experiences with transphobia with her, but I don't have anything substantial enough yet. So if you have any information, please feel free to contact me through my socials linked below. Just by the way, if you have been thinking about reaching out to me with any information, please do. Everything is assumed confidential until you tell me otherwise. Let's pivot to how everyone in the ladies who lunch responded to the public allegations in the San Francisco Chronicle, and Lorene is a good place to start. That being said, I do want to acknowledge that one of my initial responses was to laugh react this comment that Karen Alves made about Dominic and Amy being her favorite people. Oh, and note Amy's response that Karen is one of theirs too. I do want to give Lorraine credit in that I think of the ladies who lunch, she was the closest who got it right, really going hard and on the fact that she believes the victims and really going in hard to call Fapoli to resign. To the point that Fapoli's sister Marissa was in Laureen's public posts harassing Laureen and calling her a bad friend and saying that it's completely unacceptable that she's not staying loyal to the Fapolis. So more on Dominic Fapoli's sister, Marissa Fapoli Kuhn. So on W Real Estate's website, where it would appear she is a realtor, notably Dominic Fapoli was once a realtor there as well. So as you can see, she says, I have lived in beautiful Sonoma County for more than 30 years and have a lifetime of experience in viticulture through my family's company, Fapoli Wines and Christopher Creek Winery. So she's publicly affiliated with the family wineries. She's also publicly supported Fapoli even harassing his former allies in their public Facebook posts. But here she is explaining why she was harassing Lorene. My only reason for commenting on this post is because I believe Lorene to be a close associate and friend and was commenting a result of true pain and need for correspondence from someone we personally have loved from the moment we met her. At least one member of the Fapoli family is really broken up or claiming to be really broken up about Lorene calling for Dominic Fapoli to resign after the allegations went on the public record against him. And before I'd seen these comments from Marissa Fapoli Kuhn, I had been under the impression that Lorene Romero had actually been fired from her position as chamber CEO because there had always been complaint about how publicly she had been involved in politics, even though that really wasn't something she was supposed to be doing when she had that as her job. And that when it turned out she was pushing that boundary in her role for a 
serial predator, or alleged serial predator, it turned out, that that had kind of been the straw that broke the camel's back and got her fired. But once I saw those comments, and I saw that Marissa Fapoli Kuhn was affiliated with W Real Estate and Christopher Creek, I checked the Windsor Chamber of Commerce website, and it turns out that Gary Stribling, who is a W Real Estate agent as well, is on the board, and Christopher Creek Winery is still a member. So while I think the Chamber may have used another rationale and used the public outrage about Laureen's endorsement to justify the firing. Quite frankly, if I had to bet money on what I think happened, I think it was pressure from the Fapoli family. So I have sympathy for Laureen for the fact that she took a strong stance and it would appear her career suffered for it. My sympathy for Lorraine went away when I read this op-ed in the Sonoma Gazette in which she's calling for healing without really acknowledging that at least some portion of the anger being levied at her by the community is valid. And that's really the only consistent thing that the ladies who lunch have done. They really have not acknowledged that at least some portion of the criticism that they're receiving is valid. What I think is really cruel that these leaders of Windsor are doing to their community is they're asking them to go back to the happy times where, yeah, you know, the ladies who lunch, you were going to these lavish campaign fundraisers, birthday parties, he's donating to your nonprofits. You've put a lot of work in your public posts on Facebook showing the world how great life was for you up until the San Francisco Chronicle report came out. What you're missing is that it wasn't so great for a lot of other people and that we don't want to go back to that normal. I have a very similar take on this more recent op-ed from Maureen Merrill in the Press Democrat, public discourse is quickly deteriorating because Maureen seems to be putting the onus on the public to get over the hurt and the harm that has been caused so that she can get back to her normal lifestyle, not recognizing, again, that the frustration that people are expressing to her is a logical consequence for the fact that knowingly or unknowingly, she was instrumental in getting us into this situation where now Windsor is kind of an embarrassment because we had a almost like comic book character villain as our mayor. Here's what Maureen had to say. My keyboard can't capture the sarcasm, disdain, and even hatred in recent direct communications to Windsor Town Council members. But imagine you have stepped forward to serve and are then told in tones dripping with bile that you personally don't care about the people, that you are in someone's pocket, driven by political ambitions, can't be trusted, and have to go. I'm about to express how this op-ed of Maureen Merrill's in the Press Democrat made me feel to her, but I could be saying this to Deborah Fudge or Karen Alves just as easily. And I'm doing this to kind of show you that it's okay for you to do this too, okay? You, personally, Maureen Merrill, don't care about the people. You, Maureen Merrill, can't be trusted. You, Maureen Merrill, should go and stop commenting on Windsor politics. Every citizen in Windsor has a right to express that to the people that supported Fapoli until they shut their mouths and listen. You've lost the respect of the community that you claim to serve. That means you can't serve them anymore. To be clear, I really don't doubt that the ladies who lunch are receiving some really terrible, like, toxic misogyny cruelty. Like, I don't doubt that that is happening. Again, there's just the fact that there are people in this story that have literally been sexually assaulted and someone wants to play like they're the victim in the scenario because they're taking criticism for having spent years on Team Gravest. I think Deborah Fudge's and Maureen Merrill's responses really highlight the fact that these leaders care more about their reputation than they care about the community. When I was watching the mid-April 2021 special town council meeting on what to do about the allegations against Poli and to try to get him to resign, my partner was watching it and he noted that Deborah Fudge seemed to kind of be treating him like her son that was in trouble, which is kind of consistent with how she responded to the 2017 letter and gave him the huge punishment of only getting to be vice mayor instead of mayor. Yet, 
At the end of the meeting, once she realizes that she's in trouble because a lot of people are yelling at her, noting her connection to Fapoli, suddenly she wants nothing to do with him and she hates Fapoli. Deborah Fudge on her public Facebook post acknowledging the allegations. So Fudge opens with, I sincerely apologize to our community for my delayed response. And as far as I can tell, the only thing that she has apologized for is the delay in her response. So from her perspective, the worst thing that she has done in the Fapoli scandal, apparently, is make us wait a day to hear her oh-so-important response. Then she has the quote that inspired the central question of how did a serial predator become the mayor of the family values capital of wine country? The first time I learned about the additional allegations, she's acknowledging the 2017 letter. So the first time I learned about the additional allegations was when I read the article in the Chronicle. Like all of you, I am shocked, disturbed, and rattled by the allegations in the Chronicle. I don't doubt that she was shocked, disturbed, and rattled, but I think what rattled her was like, cats out of the bag. And so yeah, her saying that this contradicts the values that I've supported in Windsor during my 24 years. So she's already kind of pivoting to like reinforce my legacy, reinforce my legacy before she's taken the time to really assess everything that's going on and consider the possibility that maybe there was something she could have done better. And Maureen had a very similar sentiment in her public comment at the April, at the mid-April meeting about what to do about the allegations against Fapoli. Our community's good name is at stake. As a 32-year Windsor resident, member of the Founding Town Council, and as one who shares the dream of this wonderful community, it hurts to see this. How long will we evoke criticism, speculation, mistrust, and dark humor? Already the headlines are national, international. I fear that more, not less, tawdry news is ahead. The longer the mayor stays in position, the deeper the damage. So her concern is about the damage to Windsor's reputation, not to the people that live there. She just put that in writing in a public comment and thought that she was representing herself well. Like many who earlier endorsed the mayor, I feel sick, stricken, and confounded. We saw an incomplete picture of a person who may be seriously troubled. And that's where you all don't get to make an excuse. You saw an incomplete picture because you saw what you wanted to see. And you saw what would keep lining your pockets. And she also seems to be leaving the door open for the possibility that he's innocent. So to summarize, Maureen gets no points because she is flagrantly prioritizing the reputation of Windsor over the need to heal of the people that live there. Deborah Fudge gets negative two points for her response to the 2017 letter and her failure to apologize. Laureen Romero gets a pass because she is the only one who faced consequences. And as I said earlier, I'm not even sure that they're for endorsing Fapoli. It might be because she turned on Fapoli. However, at least all of those characters are making real attempts to distance themselves from Fapoli, regardless of whether that is motivated by a concern for the community or not. And this gets me to Fapoli's public Post. His family hasn't set up in a castle. He's apparently still living large. It's, and it's gross and it's insulting. You know, just look, if you just look at, you know, the public likes hearts, there's a lot of Fapoli name on there. Actually, I started just scrolling through the public posts of some of these family members and I discovered that Fapoli's mom had publicly tagged Amy Holter in a Thanksgiving post, and this would have been the Thanksgiving following the release of the San Francisco Chronicle investigation, indicating that Amy, our grapist beard, spent Thanksgiving with the Fapolis. Karen Alves, care reacted the status as well. So Karen and Amy, it would appear, are still in his corner. So like, yeah, like honestly, I'm super mad right now. Like Fapoli's gallivanting off in Italy. Karen Alves and Amy Holter are still considered prominent, respectable members of the community. And our Windsor Town Council continues to prioritize citizens like that's voices over the rest of us, even though it would seem that we have better judgment. Now, before I leave, 
I need to bring it back to the old boys club. Old boys clubs and ladies who lunch, they go hand in hand. The ladies who lunch are the cute little maternal figures for excusing the predator's behaviors with that old boys will be boys line. And for Fapoli, he is a very specific tie to the old boys club of Act of 2030. As I've mentioned many a time now, Bruce Oak Krupke, whose family is a bit of a legacy family within Act of 2030, was the original one to appoint Fapoli as commissioner. Well, Windsor, you still have an interim commissioner, at least that's what I'm gathering from the town of Windsor website, Sean Harrell. Sean Harrell? Sean Harrell. H-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Uh, it appears that he is still an interim commissioner. He's in Fapoli's public Venmo transactions. Looks like they got drinks together. He was in active 2030 and Fapoli appointed him commissioner. Oh, and Sean Harrell, he also publicly liked that public post from Fapoli. Ben Lair, I think is how you would pronounce it. L-E-H-R is actually a planning commissioner, was also in active 2030 and really Really disturbingly, he was actually present for one of the 2016 assaults outlined in a drinking club with a charity problem. Without going into too much detail, he was in a hot tub with Fapoli and I believe two other women when allegations occurred and this was in 2016. As always, the article is linked below so that you can read exactly what is alleged about your commissioner. So again, Sean Harrell and Ben Lair are both, I think, currently commissioners with ties to active 2030 number 50. Another prominent member of the Windsor community that I thought was worth mentioning at this point is Wayne Ingraham, a partner at Link Creative. A family member of Wayne's, Wayne is in the profile picture with that family member, also care reacted that public post of the police. And I was smart enough to screenshot it at that point in time, because when I went back about three days later, that reaction was no longer there. Wayne first came on my radar because in the San Francisco Chronicle investigation into Act of 2030 specifically, he was in this pullout quote where they're making some charming rape jokes. And this is the pullout picture actually where you can see reference to Castle Fapoli being a grape castle as well. After that investigation, I went into more about the castle. And at that point, Wayne Ingraham had left five-star reviews on both the Facebook and the Google pages. You know, less five-star review for, for a rape castle, standout guy. I left a snarky comment on the Facebook one and like the next day they were down, but I still have this screenshot from the preview. See, the top review is saying that it is an unsafe place for women. And then right under it, we have Wayne Ingraham going, can't wait to go back. Like if you could just summarize the vibe of Active 2030 number 50 in one image, it's these two reviews. So yeah, I just wanted to remind you all that even though, yes, we are focusing on the role of powerful women in protecting predators, these women are still enablers of a big problem, which is old boys clubs and the men that come out of them like Dominic Fapoli. So since my college degree is in gender studies, I would be remiss not to point out how this entire situation with the ladies who lunch is a perfect example of how white feminism has totally failed us and why black feminists, in particular Kimberly Crenshaw, coined the term intersectional feminist. Because a feminist movement led by women who are fairly privileged themselves, they define empowerment as getting a seat at the table with their male counterparts rich white men. Whereas now, the feminist movement has really evolved beyond that, recognizing that liberation for all women, black women, queer women, disabled women, is going to require a whole new table. So since I've talked about that power structure and pointed out that the ladies who lunch largely are rich, white, straight, they of course have their token marginalized person, a really embarrassing thing for Windsor is that our token minority isn't even non-white. Our token minority is a white lesbian, Laureen Romero. That is in no way a reflection of the fact that Windsor is all white. Windsor has a very prevalent Latinx community. And there are two Latina who have served on town council who could theoretically be ladies who lunch. Rosa Reynosa, well, she ran against Fapoli for mayor and they clearly backed Fapoli. And then Esther Lemus is now one of Fapoli's accusers. They of course 
have their token marginalized person. It's just something you have to have in this day and age. And in their case, it's Lorene Romero. She's an out and proud lesbian. She got the pride flag put up on the town green. To be clear, I'm not like against having pride flags in public spaces. It's just sometimes they hinder more than they help because without deeper change, they kind of become a way for people that don't really do the work and aren't really allies to the community to be able to say, oh yeah, I support the flag, I like the flag, I live in a town with a pride flag, I'm not part of the problem, right? And to be clear, the flag, the pride flag in the Windsor downtown is not being raised with a concurrent acknowledgement and healing from the homophobia that has been present throughout Windsor's history. And you don't get to argue with me about that. I am the queer daughter of lesbians. You don't get to argue with me about that. I am telling you that. And that difference in how Lorene Romero and myself advocate on behalf of ourselves and our extended community, and this is a theme that comes up not just in the LGBTQIA plus community. This is a theme I've come seen in many different kinds of activist communities, like environmentalist and BLM movements, where the previous generation, yes, I mean boomers, took on a let's try and get a seat at the table approach. And now my generation and Gen X seems to go either way, is now trying the whole, well, let's build another table approach. And there's a lot of tension because in my experience, the next generation, we're asking you for help to make our new table and they're mad at us for not wanting to come join them at that table of bigots and rapists. The fear that has been coming up in folks' communication to me is that as far as Windsor Town Council is concerned, if you were to get rid of everyone at that table who seems to have known about Fapoli, you wouldn't have very many people left. And no, we haven't built the new table yet. So that is a very scary position for the town to find itself in. What I can tell you is if you're someone who is new to the concept of maybe just trying to build your own table instead of trying to take over the table that the corrupt people made. It's not as scary as it looks. It's not as bad as it seems. So maybe give it a shot. So I really appreciate the positive response to the last video. Um, just all of the love that I got is how I was able to power through and like do a whole re-record and get a part two out. Um, so yeah, just please keep the feedback coming. Let me know, um, let me know you want to see next week. Um, do you want to know more about like commercial property and how that motivated the ladies who lunched to support Fapoli? Do you want me to look more into like James Gore and other county supervisors? How many of you here subscribe for Sonoma Academy and are still waiting for that? I have a lot of directions I could go from here and I would have a lot of fun going in any of those directions. I want to make sure that I'm researching things that y'all want me to actually research for you. So yeah, please let me know. If you're not subscribed already, please subscribe so that you know when that next video comes out. I'm going to try for Tuesday as usual, but it might be a little late. It might be more like Wednesday next week since this was such an adventure. You can subscribe to my socials. Um, there is now a If Grapes Could Talk Facebook page, or you can follow me personally on Instagram or Twitter. If you're feeling bold, a like or a comment on this video would be super helpful for the algorithms. And otherwise, until next time, you know you love me. XO.